you have this question here. A stunt cyclist rides on the interior of a cylinder, 14 meter in radius, coefficient of static friction between the tires and the wall is 0 0.64. Find the value of the minimum speed for the cyclist to perform the stunt. All right. Um, and I'm guessing, uh, I wish there was a more of a description, but I think that's a kind of how OpenStax um, phrases it. So it helps to draw uh, some figures. <laughs> um, I think it, there's a, the way I'm reading it, there's a bit of an ambiguity. So, <clears throat> but you know, it, what it's saying is a stunt cyclist rides on the interior of a cylinder, 14 meter in radius. And I think what it means is a cylinder that looks like this where the cylinder surface is vertical, this is the radius. So this is the cylinder. And the cyclist is kind of riding um, interior, like on the interior like this, kind of going uh, that way. And I'm guessing he's keeping a constant speed as the cyclist is going around in this direction. I think that's uh, what it means to say, um, but you know, there's an ambiguity here because this could have easily been, instead of, can I rotate it? Yeah, it could have easily been something that's more like this. But the reason I'm reading it the way I read it the first time is if, it, uh, um, if a cyclist is riding vertically, then it kind of doesn't make sense for it to give you the static friction. And I guess, um, and it's uh, this other thing here, it's referring to the wall. And even though you could have vertical wall, it, it just uh, makes a lot more sense here. So this is how I would be reading it. Um, so let me go with that interpretation and you know uh, i think i have enough time Let, i'll work out the numerical answer and plug it in and see what we get <laughs> so really we do as we do all force problems what you want to start out from is free body diagram that helps you kind of visualize the the scenario, how everything is interacting, it gives you a place where you can ask yourself, did I forget any force? And um, it, it's a visual problem solving tool. It's a, so it is a visual, but it's a, it's a visual problem solving tool, like a graphing paper. Um, so let me start out with a free body diagram here. And so, um, Especially when you're dealing with the circular motion questions, that is situations that involve centripetal force, it's useful to have a snapshot in mind because um, especially as this uh, cyclist is moving around, basically the directions of forces will tend to change. So for the purpose of drawing the free body diagram, I always like to have an explicit snapshot label. Let me use this as my snapshot. So that's the situation that I'm going to, this is the picture, the moment in time that I'm going to use to draw my free body diagram. So what that means is here's my cyclist. Let me just draw all the forces. So the cyclist, uh, there will be uh, gravity pulling down on the cyclist. Um, hmm, not given any mass, so I hope it'll cancel out, we'll see. <laughs> um, so gravity pulling down on the cyclist, it's always there. And, uh, oh, what's gonna cancel out that gravity because cyclists are supposed to be sliding down. And this is where, I hope you begin to notice that this is the direction of surface. So whatever the upward force is, that can, that's not the normal force. So since that's the direction of surface, your normal force should actually be going this way. So, um, oh, that must be why they are giving you coefficient of static friction force. So there's gonna be a static friction force that you will be dealing with. And um, yeah, 
So let's see, did I forget any forces? Um, so the question you are asking yourself is one, um, did I include all the forces that I know have to be there? So I included the gravity that, that almost always has to be there. And I included the two types of contact force, one perpendicular and tangential. So I think I included all the contact forces and nothing else is touching the cyclist. There should be no other force. Then the second question you have to ask and answer is, does what you see, this picture of the forces and what the net force is going to be, make sense? Does, is it consistent with the direction of acceleration? Um, in that here, when you look at these forces, the acceleration has to be pointing that way. And I hope your answer there is yes, that it is consistent with the direction of acceleration because this is the centripetal acceleration. This is the acceleration of the cyclists, cyclist towards the center of the circle. And, and you know, this is the thing that you will always have to watch out for when you're dealing with centripetal force, circular motion questions, that when you have someone who's basically in a kind of a steady motion, steady circular motion that they are accelerating. All right, so that's my standard strategy, step number one, draw free body diagram. Step number two, I um, define coordinate axis. So when I'm defining coordinate axis, I want to do it so that one of the axis is parallel to the acceleration. So I guess I'll define my axis this way. Uh, X axis that way and Y axis just perpendicular to that. That seems reasonable enough. That's kind of the standard straight axis. Um, well, I guess it's a little bit unusual that X axis is going to the left instead of right, but that's fine. Um, so the reason I want the X axis going to left rather than right is uh, I don't want to deal with the unnecessary ne negative signs. Uh, I mean, I can, but I don't want to. <laughs> Okay, that's step number two, define coordinate axis. Step number three, um, decompose forces into components. Here, I don't need to. All the forces are already in the X or Y direction. So my step number three, nothing needs to be done. Step number four, I need to write down Newton's second law equations. And I hope you kind of notice here that um, I'm going through this standard strategy without paying too much attention to given information, ungiven information, like I did note that, oh, I don't have mass, but I'm just kind of soldiering on. And it's because the equation that I'm going to write down, Newton's second law equations, it's something I'm going to need kind of regardless of what I choose to do. So let me write down those equations. So I'm going to have two equations, one for x direction, one for y direction. So the one for x direction is the normal force. That's the only force is equal to mass times acceleration. And here's something that will save you a little bit of time when you're dealing with uh, centripetal force, circular motion problems, is to kind of recognize when your acceleration is a centripetal acceleration. Just write down the formula for centripetal acceleration. Uh, mass times speed squared divided by radius. Um, that's the formula for centripetal acceleration. I don't ask you to memorize too many formulas in this class. That is kind of the one formula where, you know, it's kind of complicated, well, not complicated. It's time consuming potentially to drive it. It's much, your life will be a lot easier if you just have it memorized. So I would uh, ask you to memorize this one formula so that whenever you recognize an acceleration as being centripetal force, you can just automatically write this down. Saves you a lot of time. Okay, in the y direction, um, yeah, let me just write it down and then we'll see. Um, I have two forces, a uh, friction force pointing up. So that's gonna be my, oh, wait, wait, sorry. I guess I really should have, let me just fix a little bit of an oversight. Uh, I should have kind of justified everything as I went. So in the X direction, <laughs> what I'm writing down is the net force in the X direction is equal to mass times acceleration. 
And in the y direction, what I'm writing down is the net force in the y direction, Newton's second law. And that, that's going to be the friction force, the upward force, which isn't positive the way I defined my axis, minus mg, um, which is the gravitational force on the cyclist, is equal to, and here I'm looking for the acceleration to be entirely horizontal. So the acceleration in the y direction should be zero. So that's uh, uh, where I pause at the end of standard strategy. And I first take a stock of all the unknowns that I need to find. And then I take a stock of all the information I have, which is the number of equations. So the unknowns are, one, I'm looking for the V mean and I have a feeling that's gonna relate to the V here. So I have one unknown, let's see, mass, another unknown, and I have radius is given, that's my R. Um, friction force, that is unknown. So I have three unknowns, one, two equations, that's not enough, I need more, Oh, wait, 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 sorry, sorry. I don't only have three unknowns, I actually have four unknowns because to, to complete this equation, it's a this is equal to that. I also don't know N. So I have four unknowns and two equations. So I definitely don't have enough information. And here I'm going to kind of use my experience in doing physics problem solving. In that um, the experience is that a lot of the times Mass tends to cancel out, especially if it's a question that deals with uh, gravity and there's no other, like gravitational force and forces related to gravitational force are the only forces in the problem. It, a lot of times it happens that mass just cancels out. So I'm kind of going to take the freedom to not count mass as one of the unknowns. Then I still have three equations and, sorry, three unknowns and two equations. So that means at the outset, I don't have enough information. So this is where I need to go hunting for more information. And I see that I'm given the coefficient of friction. So I'm probably gonna be using that. So the expression that I have is the, so being careful, it's a static friction. Static friction force is less than or equal to the coefficient times the normal force. That's promising. None of these quantities are unknown. So I have third equation with no new unknowns. Three equations or three expressions and three unknowns, I should be able to solve it. And I'm going to do one more step before I start working through the algebra. And that's, I'm going to turn this inequality into equality. And Every time you do that, you do want to justify it. And my justification here is that it's asking for minimum velocity. So it's asking for an extreme case. So when I have an inequality like that, then the extreme scenario I'm looking for is when is the, um, um, when is the normal force the smallest it could be to still provide the necessary friction force. So I'm going to treat that last expression I wrote down as an equality for the purpose of this question. But um, as you saw in some of the exam questions, actually, you don't want to go to that automatically because there are many scenarios where your static friction force is less than what this maximum value, maximum allowed value Okay, so I have three equations, three unknowns. The rest of this question is kind of just working your way through the algebra, um, solving for the unknown. So um, let's see, what am I gonna do here? It looks like, um, so I, of the three unknowns, the one unknown that I actually want in the end is the V mean or the velocity. So that means I'm going to be sure to solve that last not first. So I'm going to be trying to eliminate uh, friction and normal force. So um, 
this equation three is already solved for friction. So let me plug that in here. That's going to get me my easy uh, first uh, kind of solution. Um, sorry. <laughs> so uh, plugging equation three in, what we get is uh, mu n minus mg is equal to zero. All right. So that's going to be my equation two prime. Um, oh, and my equation one is actually solved for, it is already solved for the normal force. So let me actually plug that in here. So plugging uh, this or kind of going from this equation, plugging that in, what I get is um, mu times this thing here, which is what normal force is, or expression for normal force. And if we technically, if we mean squared over R minus mg is equal to zero. Ah, great. That cancels out. <laughs> this is where experience helps. If you've done questions like this before, you see, or you can guess that that will cancel out. And uh, so all I have to do is I need to solve for we mean, and that Seems like an easy enough algebra. I'm gonna move this over. So I have G on the right hand side and then multiply through by R over mu. So that has gotten rid of G, R, mu. And I need to take the square root. So I have, this is my cleaned up version. This is my solution. V min is equal to square root of R times G over mu. And it's always worth um, double checking the units. Radius is in meters, G is in meters per second squared, per um, mu is unitless. So I have meters squared per second squared, square root it, meter per second, all seems to make sense. All right, let me plug in numbers. And um, so uh, we kind of forgot to fix this uh, rounding thing early on. So uh, for this set, you are gonna have to kind of watch out your uh, rounding a little bit more carefully. I think part of that means you have to use g equals 9.8. Sorry, I got to that a little bit too late. So the radius is 14 meters times g. I'm going to use 9.8, not the approximate value, divided by uh, the coefficient, which is 0 0.64 equals that. And I'll take the square root of that, and that gets me uh, 14 point, it says to one decimal place, six, four. Okay, so it's gonna be 14.6. Um, 14.6 meters per second. And um, by the way, this is what I mean by rounding issue. Um, if you mistakenly round it up. Oh, wow. Oh, it might be fixed already. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> then I, I guess, um, all right, never, uh, is it fixed? And I don't actually know because if it's fixed in the sense that we have been fixing it, then um, it should accept this too. Well, I don't know. Oh, we'll see maybe later. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> um, all right, so 14.6. That's the one without any rounding issue, that's correct. 